the the point of my my so, so first off, hi everybody. I'm Sean Nutter. I'm a uh, uh, data platform architect with Microsoft. I'm brand new to Microsoft. I just started 17 years ago. Um, uh, I've <laughs> I've been entirely in the uh, in the data space uh, my entire time at Microsoft. So I'm kind of a one trick pony. Uh, started out as a SQL Server consultant, then a SQL Server technology specialist, BI technical specialist, and now I'm uh, about the last three years. Uh, I've been a data architect, and I've been focused in on the Azure data service. So uh, it's basically all of the on-premise SQL Server technologies that have been moved into Azure, and, uh, and we'll kind of go into just a little bit about those to give you a little bit of a teaser here. But my goal today is really go technical hard deck on Azure Data Warehouse. Um, so my, my, I know uh, Gary already did a little bit of a poll of the room. But just out of curiosity, um, how many people here interact with data warehouses as, as part of their day-to-day -day job? Okay. So can you just throw me out some, just to help me out where you guys are at? Uh, how many people here are Teradata type people? Okay. So you got Teradata person there. Um, Netiza. Uh, okay, Netiza. Um, Greenplum. SQL Server. Okay. Uh, anybody do uh, uh, SQL Server APS? Okay. Um, okay. So that, that actually helps me out. So, um, so what Azure Data Warehouse really is fundamentally is it is a bunch of SQL servers that are teamed up, acting together like one massive parallel uh, SQL server. So a query goes into this head node, and then it literally gets sent out to this entire team of, of uh, little SQL servers all kind of working together, taking their little chunks and setting the results set back up. And so if the workload is right, you could get 100x to 1,000x performance uh, improvement over a regular SQL server. If the workload is wrong, you could really slow down and get a, you know, if you use this technology for an OLTP database, you will you will literally get could be 500x performance decrease versus a regular SQL server. So it's a it's a very you know the way I like to think of Azure Data Warehouse is it's a very it's a very uh, finely tuned, high performing, uh, massively parallel data data warehouse system. And the, the important thing is is from a technical perspective is actually identifying the right workload for this technology. Because not every workload is good for Azure Data Warehouse. Um, you might have scenarios where I, I got to do analytics and analysis services is actually the faster technology, or uh, Hadoop like uh, like um, Spark inside Hadoop could be a faster technology than, than this, depending upon certain workloads. And so it's really important to understand what the technical value of each of these Azure Data Warehouse services or each of these Azure services provide. And then figuring out what is the the right weapon, so to speak, uh, to, to bring to, to solve that problem. So, with that, these are the Azure data data services that are inside of an Azure. Okay, and so most of these services are what we call PaaS services. So you, you guys know the difference between IaaS and PaaS. Does anybody not know? Because I can cover that. Okay, so what would it put it? I so in the cloud, IaaS is basically a VM running in the cloud, right? So I provision a VM, I install a SQL Server, I have myself an IaaS. Uh, traditionally, Amazon plays in that space. Have you guys ever heard of Amazon Web Services? They are actually, in my opinion, and I'm a Microsoft guy, and I'm saying this, they're the best at running VMs in the cloud, right? This is what Microsoft's the best at. This is called PaaS. And what PaaS is, is it's not a VM, but it's a shared piece of infrastructure that is running, um, that's literally running on a fabric of many, many individual machines, right? And so the idea behind the Azure fabric is instead of having a VM running, uh, you know, running in the cloud, so to speak, what we have is we have this service fabric, kind of like a mainframe almost, we had the service fabric that lives across 
thousands to hundreds of thousands of individual computers. We actually have the expectation that at any moment in time, that computer can, that any, one, any individual computer or series of computers can fail. So this fabric is living. It's never holding all of its information on any one computer at any one time. It's constantly moving, and so you have this fabric. And so on top of the fabric, you can run programs, right? These are those programs that run on top, run on top of the Azure fabric. Now, the thing with PaaS services in general, all these PaaS services that I talk about, like Azure SQL Database or Azure SQL Data Warehouse or Azure Stream Analytics or whatever, um, the thing is, is that you traditionally need less administrative work uh, overhead to, man to manage these things. You literally just go into an Azure portal and you spin one up and it's running. Um, the bad part about this is because you can't log into any VM, you can't like tell that in or anything like that, uh, you have to live within the box that they give you, right? Well, I'll give you an example. Azure SQL Database. Azure SQL Database is phenomenal for high performing OLTP workloads. You don't have to worry about backing it up because it backs it up itself. Underneath the covers, it's running always on. And you can you can geo uh, you could geo distribute an Azure SQL database all around the world. Uh, now here's the bad part about Azure SQL database: it has a database size limit of four terabytes for an individual database. So you have to be cognizant of that when you're designing your thing. From a performance perspective, Azure SQL database will outperform any other database out there. Uh, including your on-premise SQL servers in an OLTP uh, type configuration just because of the fact we have literally hundreds of thousands of computers underneath the covers powering this thing. So Azure SQL Database uh, blows the pants off of TPC benchmarks uh, in terms of raw OLTP performance. But the bad part about it is four terabytes. And, it, and that size is growing. Um, and, and the other bad part about it is just the database. It's not SSIS or SSAS or anything else is literally just a database. So whenever you hear these PaaS databases, you got to be really cognizant of what are the technical limitations of it. But on the flip side, you got to be aware of what is the technical value that that these PaaS services provide. These, so so kind of like running through the just real high high level overview. These are our ingestion technologies. We have Azure Data Factory. The Azure Import Expert Service, uh, there's Azure Command Line Interface, like uh, AZ Copy. So if you're familiar with RoboCopy, we've got something called AZ Copy to be able to copy Azure stuff into from on-prem into the cloud. So these, and then Azure Data Factory is kind of like the uh, it's not SSIS, but it's the data movement tool. And Azure Data Factory, the latest rev of Azure Data Factory. We actually now support running SSIS packages inside Azure Data Factory. So that's that's basically our ingestion technologies. Um, Azure SQL Database and Azure Cosmos databases. Uh, these are our has database options. Um, Azure SQL Database has a couple of sisters. Azure SQL Database also has Azure Postgres Database and Azure MySQL Database all as sisters together in this, in this new PaaS framework. The cool part is, is that it's essentially the SQL Server engine just with Postgres, just with MySQL um, bolted on as an interpreter. And so, so the, the Azure Postgres database, Azure MySQL database, Azure SQL database are all very high performance, very, very fast uh, um, OLTP uh, database systems uh, for that. Next is Azure SQL Database, and we'll talk about that one uh, tonight, and that's going to be our, our where we're going to drill deep into. Um, uh, so Azure Blob Store and Azure Data Lake Store, Azure Blob Storage is basically like a, like a, a loan on a SAN. So if you need storage, you need a file share, you need a, a, just a raw LUN to do stuff for some kind of application, that's what Blob Store is. Azure Data Lake Store, if it, just out of curiosity, how many people here are familiar with Hadoop? That's around with it. So Azure Data Lake Store is a uh, HDFS compliant file system 
that allows you to store unstructured data in it. And so the idea behind uh, um, the, the idea behind Azure Data Lake Store is you ingest all your text files into Azure Data Lake Store, and then you pick Azure Data Warehouse or Hadoop or whatever to basically ingest and process these uh, these uh, text files that are in this Azure Data Lake Store. So the idea is that I, I bring all my unstructured data into Azure Data Lake Store, and then I use a structured data warehouse to ingest and kind of connect all that. Um, so we also have uh, a Hortonworks managed environment uh, called HD Insights. So this is actually a Hortonworks distribution of uh, Hortonworks HDP. Um, it's, uh, but the thing that makes this unique is we actually got Microsoft, Hortonworks, and AI managing it for you. So you don't actually have to have a Hadoop DBA. Um, what happens is, is that we literally have an AI that watches the entire, uh, the entire footprint of all these clusters. And then we do all the patching, we do all the babysitting, we make sure it's all completely online, and, uh, and then the customer just runs Spark or Hive or whatever. And inside Hadoop, there's Hive, which is very similar to like a data warehouse. So there's more than just one option for kind of ingesting some of these, some of these spec files. We also have something called Azure Data Lake Analytics. So instead of using T-SQL, we actually have this thing called U-SQL that lets you process that lets you process text files uh, and do analytics on it. And so that's that's what uh, uh, Azure Data Lake Analytics is. And then this is so if these technologies in the upper left are for for mass ingestion, these technologies in the lower left are for individual message ingestion. So if I've got uh, streaming data like coming from sensors or uh, I've got messages or whatever, um, uh, event hubs, IoT hubs, and Kafka are the three technologies that we use uh, to, to basically ingest that, ingest those, uh, those, data, that, that, those sets of data. And then from the analytics side, um, if you're ingesting individual transactions and you want to do reporting off of it, we have this thing called Azure Stream Analytics. What this does is this will let me take a stream of data off of like IoT Hub or Event Hub and I can directly build a Power BI report right off of right off of Azure Stream Analytics. So Azure Stream Analytics will make all of these sensors look like a table. And then you just say select top twenty transactions from table where blah, 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 and I actually have the ability of, of hooking that right into Power BI to make myself a, uh, you know, or reporting services or whatever, to make myself a real-time uh, real time report. And then, you know, obviously we've got analysis, so we have Azure Analysis Services, which is a PaaS version of SQL Server Analysis Services, and so, uh, uh, this one here is pretty interesting. It's, it's, uh, right now, its limitation is it's a 400 gigabyte model. It's the max size of it. However, on the flip side, you can scale this thing out uh, uh, to just un unbelievable sizes to be able to handle mass amounts of reporting and analytics. And then you also have the ability of doing uh, pass-through type, type queries to the uh, to <coughs> data source. So kind of rounding it out, um, these two here are AI, and so I don't know if you, Satya last week uh, made a uh, major announcement saying that, that Microsoft's main direction for the next couple of years is going to be artificial intelligence. And so in order to be able to satisfy on that, on that, on that requirement, all of these data services are critical to that. And so uh, we've got for your high-end data scientists, we've got Azure. We have uh, uh, Azure Mach Azure Machine Learning Server that does R and Python, and then we've got for someone who's maybe a report writer or someone that's just got basic business analyst skills, we've got Azure Machine Learning, which is uh, ML Studio, which kind of lets someone who doesn't know R, doesn't know Python, actually build artificial intelligence models. So if you've got a say that you've got a data set that you want to use to train a model and then you want it to predict something, 
Azure ML is the way to do, or if you need to do things like uh, very advanced spatial or object recognition or something like that, Azure ML is the, is the technology that you can use to kind of do that. Um, now, this is for like the data science type stuff, but we have a lot of these use cases already pre-built. That's what cognitive services is. So we actually, if, if you go to the website, uh, customvision.ai, or even a really, there's another one called uh, howoldamai.net, uh, it uses all of these cognitive services, and you can actually uh, use all of the same Bing APIs and all that to do like uh, different types of uh, different types of recognition. So um, we actually have a chatbot service uh, that is available too. It conforms to the Lewis framework. It speaks over 40 different languages. So the idea is that you could actually have an operator, and you could have uh, it do an auto language translation and be able, to, you know, basically you have instead of a call center where you've got 50 people, you could have a call center with four people or two people, and they're actually the second level of support working with all these chatbots. And so, uh, so this kind of help, helps uh, give a you know really good um, customer experience. We actually have using these cognitive services. We actually have an app on the iPhone. Um, it's for people who are visually uh, impaired, and you can actually take the so you can actually take the iPhone, and the visually impaired person is uh, can like point it, and it will audibly audibly tell exactly what it's seen. Um, and if you see, if the visually impaired person puts it over a document, it'll OCR scan the document and read the document on that person's behalf. Uh, it'll even say, you know, I see a person age 40, uh, female, smiling, or I see a person age 25, male, um, you know, neutral or angry or whatever. So it, it, it's called a, it's called Seeing AI, and it's a, it's, it's an example of how you can take these kinds of artificial intelligence services. And do good, but all of this is all part of the the data the data landscape, and so I'll skip over the others because they're boring, <laughs> and because uh, I want to get to the uh, the deep technical. Oh, by the way, Databricks is the newest kit on the block. It was literally uh, just released a couple weeks ago, and this is Spark as a service. So instead of having HD Insight, you can actually just spin up just Spark. Um, if anybody wants, on March 4th, which is a Friday, uh, we are doing a, a Spark hands-on lab. It's eight hours long, and it's uh, you know, it's really designed if I want to do high-end analytics, uh, in-memory type analytics, very similar to kind of, it's a very, it's, it's like analysis services, but it's more programmatic. Um, we're actually doing a Databricks hands-on hands-on lab on March 4th, and I can send you guys. Uh, it's a, it has to be a personal invite, so I'll, if anybody's interested, uh, just see me after this, and I can send you uh, a personal invite to get you into the class. So is that March? Or uh, what is it? Uh, May fourth. I'm sorry. May fourth. <laughs> so yeah. So when it comes to big data, these are the big data services. And then, kind of now, we're now we're into what Azure SQL Data Warehouse is, and I'm going to blast over the um, the marketing stuff and go straight to some of the technical use cases. So, your traditional data warehouse world, we would basically ETL data into a data warehouse, and then we would use some kind of cubing technology to uh, to, to do it to do a dashboard. Um, some of the more modern use cases now. Uh, include this this scenario here, where I take data from on premise and do, I use some kind of ingestion technology like Data Factory. And I, dro I drop it out to Azure Blob Storage or Azure Data Lake or whatever. And then Azure SQL Data Warehouse has this super fast technology called Polybase that is like <laughs> literally leaps and bounds faster than bulk insert, and it can mass ingest data right into the data warehouse. So this is, uh, this is what we're seeing as, as a very common architecture. And then, and then you take your analytical dashboards and you point it at the data warehouse and, uh, and build, your, build your report. Um, so that's, that's kind of uh, one scenario. This is a, a scenario of operational data. So I still have my data warehouse where I'm ingesting data from uh, you know, 
in bulk for Polybase, but I have a situation where I'm using like a Cosmos database. Cosmos, by the way, is like a, uh, anybody ever hear of Cassandra or Mongo or any of those types of database technologies? Well, Cosmos is a, uh, and, I, and I realize I didn't tell you guys what that is. Cosmos is a, uh, is a worldwide distributed database uh, that runs inside Azure. So it's got all 42, or 40, I think it's on the 44 now, all 44 Azure data centers, you can have a geographically distributed uh, Mongo or Cassandra type type database. Uh, Cosmos actually has Mongo APIs, Cassandra APIs, all of the major NoSQL APIs, all 14 major NoSQL APIs, Cosmos actually has um, those APIs readily available. So if you, and then the cool thing about Cosmos is Microsoft commits to three nines of uptime, which is the highest of any NoSQL uh, database in the cloud. And then we also commit to as long as you're going to the closest Azure data center, we will commit to you single-digit millisecond query response time out of uh, out of this database. So literally, there's nothing faster than this in terms of data, in terms of real-time data ingestion. So this is Cosmos. So the idea is that you you have you have an application interact with Cosmos, and then we use uh, artificial intelligence using uh, Databricks. And you have that interacting with your data warehouse. We're actually seeing this use case uh, quite often now. Um, it's a very common use case. That's live operational data. And I already talked about Azure Data Factory. And so, what makes um, what makes uh, Azure Data Warehouse unique from the Well, the first thing is that we do is we actually separate the storage from the compute inside Azure Data Warehouse, okay? And so what that means is that, so, so you guys know, so I assume everybody here is pretty deep with regular SQL Server, right? Is that, is that is universally okay? So you guys know that when you, when you create a SQL Server database, it's got database files, right? So in the generation one appliance, and if I get time, I'll talk about generation two, but in the generation one Azure Data Warehouse appliance, which has been out now for about two years, we have actually 60 storage containers. And each storage container contains a SQL Server database file. Okay? And so with that, so, so you've got this, you've got these 60 storage locations, each with, with uh, database files. And what we do is we give the customer the ability of spinning up one or more SQL servers that will dynamically join itself to those individual database files. And so if you need it, I could, I could spin up something with four logical SQL servers all dividing up those 60 database files. Or I could even dial it up in the other direction where I've got, I've got 60 SQL servers, each one taking ownership of all of the database files in that storage location. And the cool part is I have the ability of dynamically sliding it up and dynamically sliding it down. And so by, by taking the storage and decoupling it from the compute, that gives us the ability of dynamically scaling up and scaling down uh, uh, the, the, the SQL database, uh, the Azure SQL uh, DW database uh, very rapidly. So it takes about five minutes to actually scale up and scale down a Azure SQL data warehouse which is, uh, think about an ETL job. So here's the scenario. So imagine I've got myself day-to-day -day operations. I got myself with the equivalent of maybe a half rack of a data warehouse appliance. Well, maybe in the middle of the night, I'm just doing some crazy horrendous ETL. Well, then I can do is I can actually dial up the, uh, the compute and I could spin my appliance beam up would be equivalent to like a three rack data warehouse for maybe one hour. And then when I'm done, I slide it back down when I'm done. And so you think about it, this way, from a cost perspective, you're not paying for a three rack data warehouse running 24 seven, you're paying for a three rack data, rare, data warehouse just for one hour, right? And so that's what makes this, uh, that's what makes separating compute and storage uh, so, so key and critical. So in the appliance, um, 
we have this the, the architecture. You have a control. You have a control node that accepts all of the queries. And so this control node uh, is how we would um, how we would connect. Uh, so all like SQL Server Management Studio, uh, any application or whatever would actually connect in to the control node. And then the query goes into the control node, and then it gets sent to one or more compute nodes. And so each compute node, internally we refer, we refer to that as 100 data warehouse units. So in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We have 700 data warehouse units all connected to this remote storage. And so, uh, and so that's 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 your basic, um, you know, your basic look there. And then, like I said before is you have the ability of scaling it. So you can scale it down. In this case, scale it down to three. And then I could go the opposite direction where I scale it up. And so let me show you guys that real quick. Make sure there's no questions. So the first thing's first, uh, to, to get to this portal, it's uh, the, the management portal is portal.azure.com. And that's how you get to like your control panel uh, inside Azure. And then what I would do is I would, uh, um, I've got these things called resource groups. And these are my constructs in which I put stuff in those resource groups. So in terms of, SQL Data Warehouses, I have this one SQL Data Warehouse I'm going to click on. And then I'm going to zoom around here so you guys can see. So you'll see that for Nessar DW, and, and mind you, this is not a server. This is an actual just the database. You could have four or five of these things of differing sizes. Okay. And so I've got Nessar DW, which is a SQL Data Warehouse. And my common tasks are I can load data, I can scale data, uh, I've got the ability to do in monitoring. Um, by clicking on the open Visual Studio button, I can, I can uh, open up, uh, you know, uh, SQL Server data tools automatically with the connect string that I need. Um, uh, then I can also dynamically open up the database inside Power BI. But in this case, I want to show you guys how to scale it. So I'm going to click on the scale button here right here, so let me zoom out. I'm going to click on it, scale. And so right now, my data warehouse is, uh, is only at 100 data warehouse units, and I'm charged $1.51 an hour for this 100, this 100 data warehouse units. What I can do, is simply say, scale it up to 400, and say save. And so the cost of it goes from $1.51 an hour to $6 an hour. But the what, hap what happens underneath the covers from a technical perspective is each individual SQL server is paused. It detaches from all of its data files, we add, so in this case we went from 100 to 400, so we added three more SQL servers, and now what it's doing there at the covers is it's taking all 60 storage locations and all of the database files in those 60 storage locations, and it's divvying them up amongst all of the SQL servers to, to take ownership of those SQL servers. And that's how, that's how the, 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 the scaling works. So is there any questions on that? Is that pretty straightforward? Okay. Yep, so right now the database is in a scaling state. And so it'll take about five minutes for it to, uh, 
on average for it to uh, to to scale. So the other thing that you have that makes Azure Data Warehouse pretty interesting versus like a a, a regular SQL Server is as I talk to you about I can scale up and scale down, I actually have the ability of scaling it to no compute unit. Get that? So so I could go from one, two, three, four, five, this was five hundred data warehouse units, I could actually scale it to nothing. And so by scaling it to nothing, I keep the data warehouse, it's just in a pause state. So uh your charge for the storage, which is like pennies, right? But the but you're not charged for any for any compute resource. And so this is really good if you have a scenario where maybe you've got operations going Monday through Friday from eight to four, and usually on the weekends I don't have anybody working. Or another option is dev and test. So you think in a dev and test scenario, um, uh, you know, in a dev and test scenario. Maybe I only want to, you know, maybe I want to do, I don't want to do any dev or test over the weekend, uh, but I want to keep the database in, this, in that current state. So I have the ability of just flat out pausing it where, uh, you know, people, you know, where you're not, there's, you're not going to be charged there. And then I have the ability of unpausing it, and you can unpause it to whatever size you need it to be, right? So, um, so, and, 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 and just to show you, right now we're probably in the state of, uh, just to show you what that looks like real quick. So right now the data warehouse is, is scaling right now, but what I could do is the pause button is right here. That's how you pause it. By the way, there is a restore. Uh, that's important though too. Um, underneath the covers, each SQL server gets a transaction log backup every two minutes. Okay, um, and then we do an entire full backup every four hours. Okay, of the data warehouse. So, in, in, in on Azure Data Warehouse, with the Generation One appliance. There's a maximum size of 250 terabytes compressed. In the Generation 2 appliance, there is there is no size limit on an Azure Data Warehouse. Um, so, and I'll talk about that. But, but basically, uh, just imagine taking a 250 terabyte <coughs> data warehouse and doing a full backup on it. We do it every four hours. <laughs> so, just so there's a lot of stuff that happens underneath. Now, underneath the covers. What we give you an SLA of, we give you an S, we give you a, a uh, um, we give you a service line agreement of eight hours of recovery time because our four hour windows, we they happen on our schedule. We do a four hour backup every four hours, but because that's a sliding window, we want to commit to you that you'll have a full backup of that database at any point in time. So we say we'll commit to the customer eight hours, but just know underneath the covers. We've got every two minutes. We've got transaction log backup. I think it's uh, differentials every hour, and I think it's uh, four hours for a full. Um, and remind, but just remember that's on every each, indi each individual SQL server. So we do all those backups on top of that. But we handle that all underneath the covers. And when you restore, you actually restore from a restore point. We retain three months of backup for you, so you can restore that database, uh, um, you know, you know, months down the road. And then here's the really cool part: you can keep this guy up and running, and you can always restore a restore point to a new data warehouse database. And it takes like five minutes. I mean, it's just like it's 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 things that back in the back in the on-premise SQL data warehouse days, I wish we could do. You could just do it now. So, it's, so you can just, it, it's, it's really simple. Um, yeah, so it's up and running now. Just for fun, I'll, I'll show you the restore points here. So, so if I click on the restore button, 
you give it the name of the database you want it to, you want it to restore to, and then you pick the the last restore point. And like I said, it's about three months or so of uh, of restores that you can restore from. And the cool part is is that it's got a because Azure Data Warehouse we actually geolocate uh, all of the store all of the backups in a Nether Azure data center. So you automatically have geo redundancy. Open. So you don't have to. It's a cool part. DBAs don't have to worry about this. The DBAs, all they do is they say, all right, if if US, so this is currently running in Central US. If Central yet Central US Azure Data Center became a big smoking hole in the ground, um, I think the backup for Central US is US East 2. You would just simply restore the restore point to US East 2, and you're up and you're up and running. So, I mean, th this is the kind of things that the cloud gives us now uh, that we can't. You, you couldn't even fathom doing this on premise. Um, so I'll try to go to 7:15. I know we're at 6:47. You know, I, I've got a lot of yeah. Yes, sir. John, before you get too far away from scalability, I have yeah. a question. Is there a way to set up a, an agent or schedule the scalability yeah. uh, for you? So, so the question is for those cats on the phone: uh, Can we schedule the scalability? Yeah, it's a it's a uh, SQL call, um, or you could use a REST API call. So, uh, uh, just remember there is no SQL agent inside Azure. So you got to do like a web job, which is the closest thing to SQL agent. So you would kick a web job off with uh, either your T SQL to to have it expand. Or you kick a web job off with your REST API calls to uh, PowerShell type scripts to actually have it dynamically scale. You could also uh, have it. Uh, you could actually put alerts in where if it hits a certain level, I want it to expand out even more. But that's a loaded one because that could uh, that could blow up on you because all of a sudden you could get a bill you know the month for would be equivalent of a three rack you know you know <laughs> so anyway so to get real granular on this architecture. So the head node actually has its own uh, ten CD. It's got its own memory. And each compute node actually has its own. Uh, it's got cores, memory, and a ten CD that's built into each one. Now remember, all of these, all of these uh, storage locations, all six of these storage locations, they all have their own uh, database file files, plural, and their own and their own transaction log files on each of these individual. Uh, database files. Um, so this essentially, so so uh, this essentially is kind of the generation one appliance. There's, it's usually about 100 milliseconds for uh, for um, uh, the speed between the compute and the, uh, the remote storage. We we actually have clustered column store index capability inside each one of these uh, each one of these compute nodes. And so the default behavior whenever you create a table is going to be a cluster column store index uh, unless you expressively request row store. So we'll use column store index as default. Um, additionally, just because I don't think we're going to get to it in the slides, there's three types of tables that you create inside here. You've got a distributed, a, a, a distributed table, a round robin table, or a replicated table. Okay, and so you can always tell from if you if you're inside a um, if you're inside Management Studio. You can always tell it's like this table here is a distributed table. And then this table here is a replicate table. You can tell by its icon what kind of table it is. So if you see it looks like this, this, and this, that means that table is replicated amongst all of the nodes inside the, the appliance. So, and the reason why that's so important is because when you do create a table, say you've got yourself a fact table, it's going to create a slice across all of the individual storage locations. And, and and the cool part is, is to go, kind of go back to the slide here.
the query comes in to the control node. The control node then will literally send that same query to all uh, to all of the individual compute nodes. Each compute node will calculate what it has, and it'll send its results set back to the to the temp to here, and then which we say will aggregate that will aggregate the aggregations that each one has done and send it back up the food chain. Okay, so so you can imagine what kind of queries would work really well, what queries would work really poorly. Because you got to remember, it's sending the query down. And so there's a lot of overhead of it creating a query. So singleton insert, update, delete are very poor for this thing. Because a singleton insert, it's got to do an insert, and then it has to do an insert across, you know, it creates that query, and it's got to it's got to manage to make sure which spot it is. So there's a lot of overhead coordinating all of that to each, each one of these each one of these uh, control nodes. So a singleton insert, a singleton update, and a singleton delete will actually go very, very slow in the appliance. However, a select where I'm aggregating a crazy amount of data, say I've got a 15 billion row table that's distributed out and I need to join it to uh, dimension tables and, and I replicate my dimension tables, you are going to get staggering performance times. It's going to be, uh, from a DBA perspective, it's almost going to be absurd in terms of Yes, ma'am. The third one is called round robin. And round robin is that if you have absolutely no idea how to replicate it or how to, if, if you don't know, like in a perfect world, a good DBA here is going to understand the, the, the type of table usage. Um, but if you absolutely have no idea, round robin is, is, a, is a safe is a safe bet. Um, but just mind you that the best thing that you can do is if the query comes in, you want you want every storage thing to be working, right? So you gotta think about my query pattern. Understanding your query patterns are critical here because if I can if I can get the entire appliance to work together, you're gonna get fast results that time. So let me give you an example. Say I do a group by a, you know, say I do select uh, sales, and I want to group by eight sales regions, okay? So I decide to distribute my stack table across eight sales regions. You know what that means? It means you got your data distributed through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's only distributed uh, by a factor of eight. You're only taking advantage of a very small slice of this appliance when you issue your query. The perfect world would be I do a select and I'm grouping by something of a factor of 60. You're going to be taking full advantage of the appliance. Now, mind you, what's going on when that query comes in, you actually are taking advantage of all of the cores in all of these individual machines here. Now, we don't commit to you how many cores you're going to get because these, these compute nodes, they change over time. So I think right now it's like 48 cores for an individual compute node, but that's, you know, and in the generation two appliance, they're actually going to be hyper-threading and a bunch of other stuff I'm going to talk about in a second. So just think about, say I had myself 10 compute, right? But 10 compute nodes, and I've got my data distributed out by a factor of, you know, maybe uh, 240, right? So if you can think about how many cores you're actually throwing at that particular problem, it's almost staggering. And you also, you think about, imagine all of it is all clustered column store. So now you really get why you can get 100x, 500x performance over a regular SQL server um, in this type of scenario. So so that that's kind of the, the, the first thing. So the, the second thing is deciding, deciding when to replicate when to distribute. So a dimension table, uh, a dimension table is best uh, for replication. A, I would say nominally sized dimension table. And, and so let me explain why. Say I have, a, say I have some data here, and I've got some data here. 
And I need to join between these two casinos. What we actually do underneath the covers is we do something called a shuffle loop. So say that you pick round robin, and it's just round robin just comes up with its own little algorithm and just, you know, shotgun distributes everything across. But if I need to join two round robin tables, I may have data sitting here, and I may have data sitting here. I have to join those two together, right? So what do we do? We actually will physically move from this guy, and we'll put it up in TempTV, and we'll move data from another one, and we'll actually put it together, and we'll join it uh, um, on one of these individual uh, uh, one of these individual compute nodes. Now, we move data at speeds of six to 800 gig a minute. So we can move data around pretty darn quick. Uh, but a shuffle move is the most expensive thing you could do in Azure Data Warehouse. So if you, if this is really where, and, and I, hate to, I took this from like one hundred level to five hundred level on there, but this is really where understanding the tactics and techniques of optimum performance in these things work really good. That's why you have to really understand that figuring out how to how to set my table structure is really important. Understanding the query patterns that are coming in from the, the head node is really important, and then also understanding the technical, you know, the technical challenges of this, uh, of like the shuffle move. We actually have, and if you guys are ever curious, I can do a one-off really deep session. Uh, we actually have some DMVs that will help you figure out if you're getting skewed or if you're getting uneven query performance response time out of this. So. If you go in and you look at all my connections on my head node, and then you look at the next DMV, the, uh, the, the node level DMV, you can actually see if this guy is super busy, but these two guys are just sitting there twiddling their thumbs. Then you know, you know what? It's my, my turn as a DBA to sit there and, and uh, maybe do some either manipulation here or something here. Also, if Say that I do lots of updates, inserts, deletes, okay? Initially, when I created my table, we automatically distribute everything even, right? So if you give us a good hash distribution key and it looks even, we'll distribute everything evenly. But if you go in and you update a bunch of these individual tables, you could actually have an issue called skew, where some of the distributions have a lot of data, some of the other distributions have a little bit of data. And that's another condition that we have to go in and and then we have to manage that. Um, so, so that that is uh, um, that that that's that's another thing that we have to kind of watch out for um, with with uh, with Q. But the way to fix Q is really simple. If you rebuild the clustered index, it re redistributes just like regular SQL Server it redistributes things. Um, I also want to make sure I caution you guys from using non-clustered indexes here. That's like a cardinal sin of data warehousing. So, uh, again, when you're using Azure Data Warehouse, I, you know, for those of you who like Star Wars, I always like to think we're actually using the dark side of the force here. We're doing things that a normal Jedi would think is perverse and, you know, just off the wall. But in all actuality, the dark side of the force, you know, brings you to past what some people think is almost perverse, you know. So, um, but this, this is really dark side of the force DBA stuff here. It's things that you would traditionally just think of as insane, but the results speak, speak by them. Uh, I had a customer uh, two years ago, a uh, healthcare pharmaceutical customer. They literally had a SQL server, a massive SQL server, mind you. Um, and what they deal in is they dealt, they dealt in specialty drugs, healthcare analytics. We took, I kid you not, a 2,000 hour ETL job, okay? But that's, but you understand, that's what these guys sell. They sell data, so they take, so their ETL process, FDA approved, 2,000 hours. We reduced it down to 47 hours, from 2,000 hours to 47 hours. And it's just leveraging, I mean, I'm telling you, just the, the stuff that we can do with this thing is just amazing if you pick the right queries for it. Right, um, or you do the right thing. So this is one thing. Data loading, uh, and I'm just going to go off slides here. We only really have like 15 minutes left. Um, data loading is interesting too. So you guys.
guys all familiar with uh, with bulk insert, right? Uh, you know, and BCP and all that. You don't do that here. We support it, but I don't want you to do that. <laughs> so let me tell you why. So we actually have this thing called Polybase. Okay? And, and by the way, Polybase is available in the Box Product SQL Server as well. What Polybase does is Polybase will let us look at blob storage, which is like a line, and we can actually take text files. And remember how I told you that sometimes it moves data between the different nodes? Well, that service is called the data movement service. Okay? So the data movement service moves data between these different compute nodes. The Polybase technology actually leverages the data movement service as well. So instead of bulk inserting, where you go through the head node on your BCP or bulk insert command, Polybase will actually let you directly talk to each individual compute node as you're reading the text file. So the fastest scenario is if I have a blob, and my blob happens to be 30 CSV files, or you know, 60 TSV files or work files or whatever the heck it is that you have on your blob. If I polybase it in, you're going to leverage every single core. Every single core will create its own polybase thread to that individual text file. And you will fast load data in that way. And the data is loaded in parallel at the exact same time. So, uh, so what does it look like from a SQL perspective? There's a command called create external table. So your command would say create external table, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, create external table sales. Open parentheses, you'll put all your columns in there, you close your parentheses, and at the very bottom of it, you're going to say where the blob is. And from that point forward, it looks like it's a regular table. But every time you issue a query, or like select star from that table, uh, it actually is leveraging the Polybase engine through the data movement service directly talking. So it could actually give you uh, fast loading. Now, it, it goes hand in hand with another new command that's only available inside Azure DW called create table as select. And so we'll call that CTAS. Create table as select is like select into. So if Polybase is to bulk insert, create table as select is to select into. So create table as select also leverages the data movement service as opposed to using this head node. So I can actually take a 30 billion row table or a 15 billion row table. I run a create table as select. I, it is actually faster for me if I want to update a really large fat table, it's actually faster to me to do a create table as select from that union data from my polybase into a brand new fact table and just rename the uh, rename the fact table from whatever fact table old to new fact table. That is the absolute fastest way to do your upsert type type thing inside this environment. So Doing the old school way where I do update, you know, so I, I take a dimension table and I update it and I insert into my, my new rows. That's kind of how we did it in the old days. Using the dark side of the force, it sounds perverse, but using the dark side of the force, what I do is I create a polybase reference to my, my flat files, and then I run a create table as select, and I import it in that way. You know, I, I bring in my, my data to like heap, and then I join the two together, and then I create a new fact table from the old fact table, and then when I'm done, I rename them, and that will just smoke anything you can select into an update uh, updated insert uh, in terms of raw performance. Blow your mind? It, you got to admit it's amazing, but the you you uh, if you we actually have a good blog the the uh, there's the Azure SQL Customer Advisory Team blog. They talk about this strategy, and they actually give uh, PPC benchmarks. And you know, uh, 
you know, and they compare like a TPCH benchmark on an on-premise SQL Server versus TPCH benchmark in an Azure Data Warehouse, and it's, you know, the results are pretty staggering. Um, I do want to. Yes. So you're going to bring your so so in the new world we don't do ETL anymore. We do ELT. So you take the extracts from your OLTP system and you put them into text files on a blob or to Azure Data Lake Store, whichever one. And then I load it. So if the data is sorted, I can load it straight in using Polybase. But if the data is unsorted, I recommend you load it at the heap table first. And then do your CTAS, your create table as select, um, you know, once the data is inside the appliance. But, if, but you, yeah, that's another good thing. Remember, and this actually is true for regular SQL Server, um, if you are loading via bulk insert on a regular SQL Server or Polybase on an Azure Data Warehouse, and you're loading unsorted data into a table with a clustered column store index, or any kind of clustered index for that matter. If your data is not sorted, your performance time is going to be slow because remember, a clustered index by its by its raw definition is is always sorted, right? So you got page splits, you got all kinds of. I mean, that SQL Server is going to be doing some crazy things going on. You're going to see all kinds of CPU spikes and all kinds of crazy things. The best thing that you can do. To sort the data before you bring it in, uh, that USQL stuff I told you, that Azure Data Lake Analytics, that's a wonderful tool to, if I've got an unsorted text file and I want to make it sorted before I bring it into Azure Data Warehouse, that's a great, that's a great thing to sort it there. By the way, that's, that's something that is important. Don't think inside the Azure world you're constrained to just Azure Data Warehouse. Remember all of those tools. It's very important if you're going to be a cloud data architect that you understand what is the best use case for each of these weapons that you have. So Cosmos Database is great for one use case. Azure SQL Database is good for another use case. Azure SQL Data Warehouse, you've got Azure Data Lake Analytics, which is that use SQL thing. So if I need to do text file manipulation, I'm going to go to use SQL every day of the week, right? Text file manipulation, it can do some crazy things. I got four text files I want to merge into one. Don't use an ETL tool. Use either Hadoop or you use uh, Spark or use use SQL to, to do that to that manipulation, and then bring that nice sorted, nice beautiful, pristine, you know, sunny looking if that's even a thing uh, text file that's already sorted. Bring that puppy in, and you're you're gonna you're, you're gonna watch as that thing gets loaded. Um, you'll see a very low CPU time as that stuff gets loaded because that's what this thing does great. And that's why. Yeah. Out. yeah, yeah. Then the problem with non so the, pro the the problem with non clustered indexes is you're holding in memory pointers to row store, and and you're still making the expensive touch to row store use. And then the problem is, is every time you change that table, you also have to update. You also have to keep that non clustered index updating, you know, with its statistics and all that. And so you're going to find that. In modern data warehousing, um, even with like non-SQL Server technologies, even Oracle and all that, uh, using non-clustered indexes is, is not a really good strategy um, moving forward. It's okay on a case-by-case -case basis, so I don't want to completely say it's never used, but there, but it's, but thou shalt be a very good use case, and thou shalt understand all the negativity that comes with using a non-clustered index. Because uh, the problem is there's a lot of overhead that you now have to uh, you have to account for. It's almost better if you have to use a non-clustered index, drop it, load it, recreate it, right? Don't, you know, don't try this, these reindeer games of trying to update it because it's just going to give you, uh, um, you know, sadness and unhappiness and, you know, gnashing of teeth and low uh, ETL and all of that kind of stuff. I know we got five minutes left. I do want to give you guys a teaser 
on the Generation 2 appliance that is going to be GA uh, in about a week or two, maybe three weeks, two weeks, something like that. It's, we're we're in final uh, final final of this thing. It's uh, um, so the Generation 2 appliance is just like the Generation 1 appliance, but the 250 terabyte limit is lifted. We have no 250 terabyte limit anymore. Um, additionally. Leveraging all of the artificial intelligence skill that Microsoft has, we actually had this thing called a 1.5 terabyte intelligent cache per individual compute node. So if I had myself a 10 terabyte data warehouse, right, you can kind of figure out, if I had myself a 10 terabyte data warehouse, I could keep everything, I could cache the entire data warehouse in memory. Just think about that for a second. So how does that work? So in the new in the new generation two appliance, we have NVMSC SSDs on each of the hardware, each of the hardware. Plus, to even add more more up to it, uh, we've literally doubled the size of the cores on the compute nodes, and we've actually turned on hyperthreading on each compute node. Additionally, you know these 60 storage locations that we talked about in the generation one appliance. We take the cluster column store index and we store them outside of the SQL Server database file. Think about that for a second. So we take the we take a certain shard size of the cluster column store index and we just store it on raw blob stores without it even being in a SQL database file. And that gives us options because now we can take each one of these little shards. And we'll just stack them up right in NVMS ESSD, uh, um, just ready to go to be to be queried. And so this we can literally cache the entire data warehouse in memory. And so we're finding 5x performance improvement compute nodes on a generation one versus compute nodes in generation two. <laughs> so if generation one is already that much faster than a regular SQL server, just think of uh, of the generation two ability over, and then the best part about it is we're keeping the cost of all this the same. So, so we're actually finding customers that have had generation one appliances, they can actually slide the slider down and actually save money over what the cost of a generation two, two appliances. So this is how the cash works, right? Here, so, right, so each shard sits inside uh, the cash. Now, because we tear out the, you know, 100 milliseconds is our is our SLA between the between the uh, um, between the compute nodes and the and the, uh, the the blob storage that that it sits on. The NVMSC cache is not measured in milliseconds, but it's measured in microseconds. So we we have for the 1.5 terabyte NVMSC cache that's inside each of the control nodes, we're seeing about 20 microseconds of response time. <laughs> it's, just like, it's, it's just amazing. So, um, yeah, so this is this will be GA in a couple of weeks. Now, there is some things to uh, the limitations of Azure Data Warehouse. I want to make sure, because I, I told you all the rosy stuff, let me tell you the bad stuff. Uh, there's a maximum of 1,024 connections that can be connected at any one time. In the generation one appliance, it's got 32 concurrent queries, concurrent queries as an estimate, which is why on the generation one appliance, pairing it up with analysis services is a really good strategy because analysis services are limited. Um, in the generation two appliance, it's going to be it's going to be going up to 128 um, uh, concurrent uh, concurrent queries, and this, by the way. Puts us way over the top for the Amazon Redshift and Google BigQuery, which are the two other cloud uh, competitors. And uh, right now, I'm personally doing two large Teradata migrations. Um, we actually have a partner of ours called the Atometry, and they have a Teradata emulator. This thing is awesome. So the cool part is you can put the Atometry on top of Azure Data Warehouse, and all of the Teradata apps think it's talking to Teradata, but really what's happened is getting a live translation um, and it's, it's sending that Teradata queries uh, to Azure SQL DW. So literally, 
you take the, the DDL and the data and move it into Azure Data Warehouse, and then you take the datometry tool and you point all the existing pair data workloads to it, and then you, and then it's just dynamically. Uh, so we we we've got two projects, uh, two large uh, companies, one here in St. Louis, one in Houston that's currently doing that. And then they then datometry also supports uh, on-premise SQL Server with uh, with their pair data emulator. So it's like it we're just seeing all kinds of crazy things now with uh, with this technology. So. Anyway, I'm at 7:17, so I'm two minutes over. Okay. Okay. So I, you know, at this point, I'm going to take a breath. And if there's any like technical questions or or anything like that, I'd love to love to answer. But I like I said, I literally have like hours of more content on this. And, and by the way, if there was ever interest from the user group, uh, I could always do a uh, hands-on lab with you guys. Um, uh, with it, if it was ever if it was like you know talk about yourself, but if there was ever like interest, you could do it's like a four hour long thing. So it would be you get to create one, you get to load data, you get to see what the queries are, you get to see the the warm stuff in your belly, and kind of get your uh, get your handle. Right now, all up inside Microsoft Azure SQL Database is the number one Azure Data Service in use, usage uh, globally. Um, Azure Data Warehouse is the second most used Azure Data Service and makes the insights the third most used. Uh, third most used. Um, my primary customer right now is a company that has a working bed. Anybody work in EDI? Okay. And right now we're running 30 site clusters and they're one of the top 10 global users of Azure Data Warehouse. So uh, pretty, it's just pretty staggering to see uh, um, just, you know, where the genesis of like the on-premise SQL um, Security-wise, that's another good one. Security uh, uh, supports always on, are always encrypted, so uh, you know that's all. That's all the clusters, all all kinds of different certifications that you've got now. And, um, yeah, pretty pretty cool. Like I said, it's easy. All you got to do is go to the Azure portal, set it up, and then by the way, um, if you have a Hotmail account, you can do it. You can do a 30-day free trial of Azure, and at the end of the 30 days, you just turn it off. And so, what I would do if you really want to get your hands dirty and your company maybe doesn't do it, I would create my own Hotmail account, like you know, John Messer playing with Azure at Hotmail.com. You go, you then go to Azure.com, you can spin up your own account. You got to give your credit card, not to be charged, but just to validate if you do something wrong in Azure. We've got to have someone to, you know, to go back to you know, if you're doing something illegal or immoral or whatever. Uh, so we won't charge a credit card, but um, you, you put your credit card in there to validate and it, you know, it's like, I think it charges your credit card to change or something like that. But it's just enough to actually validate that you are who you think you are. But that's 30 days, then after 30 days then you delete the account um, and, you know, I think, I think they give you something like Four or five hundred dollars of Azure to play with, um, and you saw um, you saw that like Azure DW for one hour at DW one hundred is like a dollar fifty. So you can set up VMs and play all kinds. Of I do this all just to let you know. I have a whole long list of email addresses I can set up, and I, I uh, you know we have our internal Azure built up, but if I want to do something really crazy, um, I spin myself up. Uh, and for like a lab, if we did a lab. That's how I would do the lab. I would have everybody create their own little Azure account, and then I would give you guys the last contact and we'd run through that. And they, in fact, the thing that we're going to do on March 4th is going to be, uh, or May 4th, May. it's going to be uh, that, that same way. So, well, guys, thank you. Hopefully, this was fun. Um, I only put a couple people to sleep, so I, I thought it was a good time. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, so, uh, the lunch or evaluation form, bring it up to me and I'll give you a raffle ticket. Got some, does everyone have a